Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you, Sarah. I'm excited to be here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, are we, we ready to roll? Sorry, I was away from my computer. Yep, we are ready to roll. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, my name is Josh Riddick. Um, some of you may know me or have been connected with a previous talk that I did here at, at uh, GlobeMed. Um, it is always incredible to collaborate with y'all. I think you're a, a fantastic collection of people, a fantastic network, um, and it is an honor to be here. Um, virtually, I'm physically in Indianapolis, um, which is located in central Indiana, traditional Miami, um, Potawatomi land, um, uh, and land that, that is still occupied, um, both by, by my, my person as well as others. Um, and this is a, a beautiful community that has an intersection of um, healthcare inequity, healthcare crises, as well as a, a significant um, refugee and immigrant migrant population. And so the intersection of global health um, takes place here in Indianapolis in some really unique ways, um, ways that have given me some helpful insight. Uh, folks who have brought their narrative uh, to the forefront of our community in a way that's helped expand my imagination. Uh, and I hope to, to bring those learnings here today. Um, so I have the task of helping us reimagine global health, um, which I think is a, a deeply critical work that has to happen uh, for us to be able to adequately engage in the global health space, um, to adequately engage across cultural, national, linguistic lines um, that exist in our world. Um, and I have some experience working in global health. And I would say in the dark cellar basement of global health that folks don't want to always talk about our name, um, the ways in which global health benefits uh, wealthy Western travelers at the expense of communities that are in harm. Uh, so I, again, I want to bring all those learnings to the forefront today uh, and have a dialogue. And, and my hope in my facilitation style is, is hopefully to get folks to engage and share. Um, you certainly don't have to have your camera on, uh, whatever you feel most comfortable with, we welcome that. If you want to fire off in the chat, you're welcome to. If you want to um, unmute yourself, you're welcome to. Before we begin, though, I shared where I'm currently located. I would love to hear um, where some of the folks who are in the Zoom room are calling in from. Um, where are they located? Um, uh, where in the world are they at right now? I know we can be in so many different places, and I'm interested to know where we find ourselves. And maybe we can use that uh, that connection is part of our conversation tonight. So I'll mute and, and either let people unmute or you could share in the chat. New Jersey, okay. New Jersey is a, 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 a spectrum of experience. I know like Camden and Newark, that's my familiarity with Jersey. What, what is that? What do you mean by Jersey? Um, I'm in North Jersey, so about 45 minutes from New York City and then two hours from Philly. Okay, awesome. That is helpful. Helpful. I see uh, DC, Chicago, Cincinnati. Awesome. Awesome. Detroit. Uh, shout out to Detroit. I'm from Michigan, so um, y'all want to texture this some more. What? Talk to me more about what it means to be in the city that you're in, um, more about the location. Uh, maybe distance from other places, maybe the specificity of the community itself. Um, I'm on the near east side of Indianapolis, uh, meaning I am on a side of town that has was largely spared from redlining, but still was uh, had a highway system in the 60s put through that decimated the pre-existing Black community. Um, so my community is just now rebounding uh, from some of those policies, and therefore it's rapidly gentrifying. So the type of community I live in is, is evolving as we speak. Small town close to Charlotte, Cherryville, North Carolina. Um, thank you, India. I've never heard of Cherryville. Uh, I'm actually going to be in Raleigh. And so maybe I'll pass it in September. So maybe I'll pass a place like Cherryville. Um, North Carolina is such a fascinating place to me. I am my generationally, um, my family uh, who, who was enslaved was brought to North Carolina before. Um, eventually moving themselves to Virginia and Maryland. So they have a limited connection there. Oh, shout out to Hamtramck. I love Hamtramck. Um, this description is, is incredible. It is such a dope city. Uh, such, uh, we use words in, in America like melting pot. 
um, in such a poor descriptive way. And I think Hamtramck might be one of the few cities in America that is legitimately a melting pot. Um, it's such a beautiful community. So maybe I'll try to weave, weave some of that into the conversation today. Thank you, Christine. And people talk about Detroit, by the way, they say things um, that I think are, are accurate, but Detroit has been rapidly gentrified as well. And so some of the, the old soul of the city is, is changed and adapted and evolved. And Hamtramck is one of those communities that I have, I believe has been underappreciated. Um, awesome. Well, thank you all for that. That is really dope. Um, I think where we exist in place uh, is so crucial to our own narratives and how we see the world. Uh, but let's get into this conversation. I don't want to take all of our time talking about cities that I barely go to. Uh, that, that's the productive use of our collective time. I really have three goals tonight. Um, three what I hope to be basic goals. Three what I hope to be um, palatable goals. And I would invite anyone who, who needs you know, more clarity, like Josh, this isn't tracking, um, break that down a little bit more, um, say that again. Or if you were really feeling that, like you're welcome to say like, yo, run that back, that was great. Um, if you disagree, you're welcome to push back. This is a, a collective dialogue. I'm bringing some wisdom, um, but you all carry another type of wisdom that I think could build together. So my hope tonight of these three goals is understanding global health as a commodity. Um, the second one is interconnectedness of global systems. I want us to become systems thinkers. And the third one is embodying partnership. Uh, and I'll give some more context to that, but this is such a critical part of the globe med model. Um, I don't know if I'll sit too much with the practicality of how to build partnerships as much as what I observe as a generational shift that is taking place. Um, and the emerging leaders that we have that we might want to be conscious of and how we understand partnerships. So Sarah, if you can kick us over to that next slide, we'll, we'll get it moving. So I first want to start off, um, you know, giving a definition of health that many of us probably already know, uh, but I think it'll be critical to the conversation because I think this definition is really fascinating, especially when we think about something like the term commodity. Um, commodity mean like a product or a good that can be bought or sold um, or capitalized in some type of way. Um, and in most of our capitalist systems, health is something uh, that is absolutely turned into a commodity, a product or a service that can be packaged and purchased and, and, and gained. And when we say commodity, when I say commodity, um, I also am implying that there are folks who have access and there are folks who do not. Um, as opposed to a uh, you know, public good or um, freely accessible thing. Commodity also implies something that is not widely or universally accept accessible. So this, this definition here comes to World Health Organization. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. I want to read that one more time. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So with this definition, what comes to mind? Are there things that say, ah, that, that seems to be the most, is that the most expansive definition of health that you've seen? Do you feel like it's missing something? What would add more texture or flavor to this definition that we have here? or this is the most profound and robust definition we've heard, which is may very well be the case. This is, if you've ever followed the World Health Organization's definition of health, it has been an evolving thing. And this is being the most recent, it is a pretty expansive definition. But when we think about something as a commodity, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. How often in our lives have we been in a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being? And who do we imagine to be the individuals that do have complete physical, mental, and social well-being? So I wanna to go to the next slide because I think there's a, a voice that we may need to check in with um, that could challenge this definition in a way that maybe we don't often think about. So this is uh, Deshaun L. Harrison. Deshaun recently um, penned a book called Belly of the Beast. Uh, the Politics of Anti-Fatness, Anti-Blackness, uh, um, incredible work. Uh, they did such a dope job um, putting this together at the intersections of, um, uh, oh good, I'm, I love that you just started that. I'm, I'm 
yeah, they got a reading group out there. It's definitely like worth checking out for real. Uh, but early in the book, Deshaun points out this. As I interpret it, it being the definition of health by the World Health Organization. For one to be healthy, they must not only be non-disabled, but also must be an environment that allows them to feel mentally secure, physically safe, and socially well. As such, this means Black people, especially those of us that exist with multiple marginalized identities, are already unhealthy because we are already unsafe. And so thinking about this notion that uh, this definition cannot encapsulate the experiences of a large collection of people, and in this particular context, they are referring to um, Black people within the United States. But if we were to expand that definition to those in emerging uh, nations, developing nations, those who are in uh, non-white, non-Western uh, locations and positionalities, those who are working class, Black and brown working class people globally, um, this definition cannot encompass their experience. And therefore, they don't actually have access to health. Meaning that for health to be commodified in the first place, only certain people have to have access to it. Well, that's currently the system we have right now. And that's not an idea that is particularly uh, mind blowing or new to any of you. I'm certain of that. But what I want to get at is that over the last 20 years, there has been an increase in global health curricula and programs and experiences um, for emerging students, for college age students, young adult students. Um, in America, under the notion that involvement in these things can lead to a greater impact in places where there are folks who are being oppressed or marginalized. But what Deshaun is inviting us to think about is that the definition that we may carry of health cannot actually exist in our current world. We have to literally, as, as they write in their book, destroy and deconstruct the world and its systems to create what health needs to look like. And yet, we have millions and millions of dollars every year designed into programs to equip students to be global health practitioners, to give students global health experiences, to give students global health trips and travels. And there is an entire industry built off that. I collaborated and worked in a global health organization and routinely was rubbing up against what, what were called competition. Uh, because there were groups that were having more efficient, more frequent, cheaper trips. Uh, it became a commodity in which students can uh, exploit an experience um, with, for the, get, get the biggest bang for their buck. I get to go an extra week in this country. I get to go to the jungle in this country. I get to go do a cooking class in this country. And those who are supposed to be helped were being exploited. Um, and their, the notion of what health that was being provided was not at all something that resulted in their physical, mental, or social well-being. And again, this is not a new idea for us. This is something that we probably observe and see. But what I want to invite us to consider is in what ways are the institutions that we invest in for our own development complicit in participating in this, particularly when we think about the academy, we think about universities, that universities use global health as a marketing pitch, as a selling point. Um, yes, the healthcare industry has expanded and there's a greater need for jobs. So we've seen an increase in public health and global health programming. Uh, but some of those things are an effort to try and woo people in and draw people in. And what, I, I, what I'm considering is that some of the, the programs that we may participate in, um, some of the institutions that we are connected with or support and attend are actually perpetuating a flawed expression of what health is, giving us as positions of people in positions of power, the assumption or the feeling that we're making an impact, um, knowing that it's not actually making a difference. And so what does it mean to be participating in systems that are doing that? And what, what responsibility do we bear in addressing those systems? Um, that's an open question. I would love to you know, think about your institution or the institutions you're connected with. How is global health perceived or presented at your school? Um, is there a notion that uh, the health that folks need, we maybe aren't being taught and we can't provide and what is our role in assisting in that? Let me know if you're tracking with this.
this is more on a campus level, but if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, but like a common complaint at my school is that the administration like talks about mental health and wellness a lot, but it feels like they're mostly just paying lip service because it's actually very hard to make an appointment at our at CAPS, which is like the department that kind of heads that. And they're also all located like off campus, so they're not very accessible to go to. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a that's a tremendous example. And that's a very common problem I've heard for mental health services on campus. So you as a, a student and others as a student, if needing that service to be healthy, cannot get access to it. And what I want us to interrogate is where we are investing our resources or folks who are supporting us are investing our resources where we might plan to invest our resources uh, at the whatever precipice in which we receive more um, into institutions that are not actually fulfilling their commitments um, to things like health and that they are paying lip service. And in what ways are we being formed and shaped by these institutions um, to commodify health as well? Um, in what ways are we being formed and shaped by these institutions um, to, to continue to support environments that are ensuring that people are remaining unwell. Um, that's, that's what I'm thinking about as, as we think about health as a commodity. What else comes to mind as, as, as we're having this conversation? Um, so one thing that I'm thinking about is that we recently had um, uh, the primary election here in, in Detroit and on the ballot was uh, proposal P, which would allow um, the allow for the city charter, the city constitution essentially to be changed. And there was a bit like part of that was to um, guarantee uh, water access as a right and um, the like mayor and the city, uh, a lot of the city officials had funneled a lot of money um, to defeat the proposal it didn't pass so um, there was like the Detroiters Bill of Rights which was um, created using input from people and one of the one of the rights was the right to water access and uh, that is now now not allowed to or not going to be added to the city charter and the like idea that water is a commodity and needs to be paid for um especially in like these times where we're being told to wash our hands all the time who is allowed to freely wash their hands to be safe and physically well and who is not it's a, a powerful question um and the solution often is organizing even when it in this situation is a, a, a not a win that we want to see. Um, I'd love to, to move to our, our second kind of motion tonight, um, which is becoming systems thinkers. Because again, we recognize that health, global health in particular, is a commodified product, service, or good. Divestment is a great step to ensure we're not supporting organizations, institutions, individuals, actors, who are perpetuating a flawed framework of what health is or parading around pretending to offer some expression of health that is not accurate. We have to recognize who is supporting and upholding those actors. How are they allowed to navigate systems while generating harm and in what ways are those systems um, doing that? So I wanna pivot to this next move. So Sarah, if you could take us to the next slide. I wanna take a quick trip down South um, my family lineage does not go as far south as Louisiana, Mississippi. Uh, and so this sort of physical connection, um, I, actually, I shouldn't say that. I do have family lineage in Mississippi, but it's northern Mississippi. Um, we are looking at a map of uh, cancer frequencies in the state of Louisiana. Um, the darker it gets, the more frequent we see cancer appear. Um, and this is just Louisiana. There are red hot spots like that all throughout the country. But this particular map is something of a, an anomaly. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, I could break that down a bit further. Um, we're zoomed in a little bit down the Mississippi 
This is a, a strip called Cancer Alley. And you will see that uh, toxic air exposure risks are very much higher for folks in black, predominantly black census tracts along this strip of land. Um, again, this is not by any sort of accident, as we know. Um, the low risk communities are largely white, um, although there are a few black communities that are low risk. All communities should be low risk or no risk. Um, but along this strip, we see there is a, a collection of high risk communities, particularly in Baton Rouge and just outside New Orleans. We can go to the next slide. Um, they call this place Cancer Alley. It's an 85 mile stretch down the Mississippi um, where cancer rates are 50 times worse than the rest of the country. Uh, so where do we, how do we get to that place? How do we get to a place where cancer rates were 50 times higher than other places of the country? And we're considering that there are many, many Flint, Michigans of the world. There are many, many East Chicago, East Calumet, Calumet of the world. And yet a place like this can jump out as being so horrendously bad in environmental wellness. So how we got here was beginning in 1968, petrochemical plants set up shop along the Mississippi River, um, left largely unbothered by regulators. These plants produce toxins in the air, roughly 800 times the national average. Not even a few miles from some of these plants, um, which is now owned by a company by the name of Denka, which is I think believe an overseas company, but it was a, um, a company based in the US until 2015. Um, this, these companies were pumping toxins in the air uh, every day that just uh, in any small amount could be dangerous to human well-being. But the rates in which they were going to the air were, were absurd, again, 800 times. Um, the EPA came in in 2015, realized there's a problem here, despite years and years of organizing from the local community saying uh, something is wrong here. People are dying uh, of cancer at ridiculous rates. And uh, it wouldn't then be until 2017 um, when Denko would agree to lower their emissions um, voluntarily. But they have still named that it is technologically impossible for them to um, fully remove the necessary toxins to make it safe for the people around the plants to live and breathe. So they're still producing slightly less chemical damage. Um, but still a significant amount. And so the reason I, I point out this story is because from 1968 to 2017, there was a, a rate of pollution that out, outraced most of the country, if not the state. And for that amount of time, people were dying of cancer uh, amongst other negative health outcomes. They could not actually experience quality health. They could, by the World Health standard they could not, World Health Organization, they could not experience health. We would say that's, that's wrong. It's, it's morally and ethically problematic. Um, somebody should be held account. But by our legal and environmental standards, these companies didn't actually do anything wrong. They didn't actually fail. And so what I want us to, to move towards is we think about systems, what failure looks like and how we're conditioned to think about failure is a very kind of linear way of processing things. And that's especially true within the global health landscape uh, in, in how students are conditioned and shaped and educated. That we identify um, bad actors or bad individuals and we try to remove them. So we could, we could put pressure on Denka to get rid of the, the harmful toxic chemicals in their plant. In fact, if we got to shut them down, if we all went and chained ourselves in front of this plant until they, uh, shut it down, um, then we wouldn't have actually solved the problem because there are still numerous other plants along the river. Uh, there are actually numerous other plants that generated water pollution that is nearly as bad as this air pollution um, and still continue to do that. That when we think about some of these systematic or systemic failures, both of which occur, uh, they are not always because somebody has failed, but because the system is not designed to actually stop them. And we try to hunt for broken pieces, hunt for broken problems, um, instead of trying to observe where the system actually needs to be adapted and where it needs to be changed. Sarah, if you can go to the next slide for me. Uh, we have to be able to step back and see the larger system here. Um, my, my conviction is that to reimagine global health, we have to reimagine whole systems and not merely fix broken components. 
So thinking about uh, the Christine, the example that you gave, we're, we're trying to fix um, a specific problem that exists, a specific lack of uh, accessibility. And we should pursue those things, particularly around clean water, water access, absolutely. But the resistance to that is a larger systemic structural challenge that we have to address. And what I have observed is for a lot of folks in the global health landscape, um, there is a pursuit of trying to solve individual problems. I, I got a chance to, to do some work with Eli Lilly last year, um, and they were very much interested in addressing um, food access and nutritional access in uh, a small town in Guatemala that I had some, some organizational connections to. And so they were helping launch a food program to get some kids weighed up. And, and it was a, a really beautiful commitment by some of the staff from all over the world who were wanting to make a difference. But at no point did anyone ever ask why these kids were hungry, what were creating the circumstances for kids to be hungry. It wasn't actually a lack of food. There was groceries, there was enough grocery stores around. Um, there was enough fresh food around. There were some other larger systems, systems related things that they were not interested or even able to imagine or address. And so they participated in a food program that was successful in what it intended to do was get these 20 or 30 kids out of a malnutrition status. But once, the, once they age out of the program, they're still at risk of falling back into a, a place of unwellness physically because they're not going to have access to food. There was not a larger addressing of the system here. And so I, I wanna hear from y'all, this, is this making sense so far? Are we tracking with this? In what ways maybe are you at, identifying ways that you've been shaped to think about hunting out broken parts versus finding uh, and rethinking, reimagining uh, the larger system. I think it's a lot like easier um, and more approachable to, like, I think a lot of the reason it's easy to get into the mentality of approaching things as if like there's an indiv like one individual thing that we have to address and then that'll fix the thing is because it's a lot easier and more approachable oftentimes to think that way um, instead of thinking like there's this whole, you know, systemic, you know, problem and it connects to all these other things and it goes back in history. If you just think, oh, well, if we just, you know, give these people this one thing, or we just pass this one thing, then then it's fixed. It like feels much easier and more manageable to engage with, which I think is why it's such a compelling line of thought. And it's so hard to get out of and hard to like make yourself get out of even when you know that it's not like a very useful line of thought. Um, and I think it also probably connects at least in America to like the culture of kind of individualism and how that's something that we're always kind of focusing on in the stories we tell. Um, both like as a, a good thing is something like we focus on, we, you know, praise individuals and really focus on like the individual story and the individual genius instead of focusing on like networks and systems of people who work together to like solve problems, right? But also I think we like to focus on like the individual bad guy, like the one villain, the super villain, you know, that kind of thing. So I think it's also probably a bit of a related to that product of like that kind of culture of how we tell stories a little bit. Yeah, that's really dope. That's really dope. Can you can you share a story that you've had a hard time um, demythologizing or stepping away from, or a story that had a hold on you for a long time about what it means to solve a, a large problem through an individual action or effort? Um, is there a story that comes to mind for you as something that was a challenge? And if so, why was it so hard to get away from? Uh, kind of related to that, I think something that I always, because I've always really been into science. Um, and so I always really was like entranced by the ideas of like these great scientists um, who made like these individual discoveries and breakthroughs. Um, but then like, as I've gotten older and I've learned more about like how science actually works and how they're like whole teams of labs, um, like technicians and a lot of like you know, like even if one or two people get the Nobel Prize for something, like there are all these other people who they would have been, you know, working with and all these other like countless, countless ideas that would have gone into their theory and even just like technicians and other people who would have been working with them on something. Um, 
that's something that was really like a big kind of brain shift. And it's also like, it's not just like an individual genius or an individual like good idea or even uh, like that, that allows you to make like a breakthrough to have a really cool idea. It's also like the ability to have a good education and have an access to a lab, like the ability to get a PhD. It's like being able to be in a place where you have access to the systems that can give you the ability to have those, you know, breakthroughs or be in those rooms that will then lead you to be able to like have those thoughts like with other people. So it's a whole bunch of like systems and networks and the idea of like the individual scientific genius isn't, um, I don't quite think has all that. I don't know. I don't uh, anymore quite like um, agree with it all that much, but it's definitely an idea I was very entranced by as a young youth. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'm, you know, as, as you process this conversation, I'd be interested for you to consider what informed and told you like that's the right thing to be thinking about or that's how you should be thinking. Because yes, this macro narrative of, uh, coll coll you know, individualism that's so pervasive exists, but then there are those who, who either divested from that and still took a long time to get to some of the thinking that you're going through or never have gotten there. Um, oh, I see your, your hands up. Uh, go ahead, my friend. Yeah, no, the way um, this conversation, like, it reminded me of this actual, like, article I read recently, and I'm, like, trying to find it currently. I can't seem to find it, but um, it was, like, titled, it was a New Yorker, and it was, like, Why Americans Are Dying from Despair. And so, like, the title of it, like, caught my eye, and it was in the economic section. So I was, like, all right, why is, like, an article that I feel, like, would be more catered to, like, health and global health? and the economic section of this um, article. But as I got to read it more and more, basically the case that was made, and it's like a really interesting read, if I find it, I'll drop it down here, is that the rate of unemployment in America in terms of local communities has gone up from 2002 to now. And that's like added multiple other things, such as like stagnation, it's added, you know, uh, obvious income inequality. And like these larger things at play have actually led more Americans to suffer chronic pain, to die from overdose, to die from suicide. And so like, it caught my eye because I would never think that joblessness or something that was you know, ingrained, like the entire economy as a whole is actually leading to deaths, especially for marginalized populations as the article made in its case. And so like, I feel like it to, when we're reimagining global health, we have to think critically about not just all right, we had certain people dying from pain, you know, the quick solution would be, all right, it's the opioid situation. You know, people are, we have an influx of opioids. Yes, opioids are a part of the problem. They're a symptom of the problem though. But in order to like reimagine the whole system, you have to think deeper. And like the people that made this case, I'm pretty sure they like won the Nobel Prize in econ. So it's like people that are thinking macro, people that are like looking at, that are like aggregating data. And they're seeing this from not, just you know one perspective or from one community but they're saying all right this community connected to this community what are those patterns that we can see and how can we reimagine it so the reason i brought it up is that i think that becoming a systems thinker entails you being multidisciplinary in your thinking not just focused on one issue and then looking for patterns you know one individual in one community is extremely important but they're only one part of a larger picture too so i think that the article made a really interesting read. I just found it. I can drop the link for it if anyone's interested, but it kind of brought me back to um, what it means to be a systems thinker. Yeah, go ahead and throw that in the chat for us so we can we can learn together. That's fantastic. Um, and then Priya, I see your comment uh, that these things going hand in hand, that mental shifts are very much a part of deconstructing and transforming systems that prohibit this expansive definition of health we're talking about. Um, and I, I'm... I wonder, again, thinking about the limitations of academia, the limitations of the academy, um, moving towards a more multidisciplinary space is, is one of the ways in which global health has been commodified, is that institutions that um, can provide multidisciplinary trainings can then promote their global health program and then sell that to you as a student, where a liberal arts institution who I was already doing multidisciplinary stuff. I can't market it that way. May not have that or a small community college for, per se is probably a better example. Can't market that. Um, I think you're right, Raul, that, that 
multidisciplinary thinking has to be there, but all of these individual notions um, still can be commodified. Um, and I would say one of the things that are a little bit harder to commodify, um, that is, I think, really critical to becoming a systems thinker, is, is tuning ourselves to the stories of those who are most impacted by these systems. Um, one of the folks I'm currently organizing uh, with is an individual who um, was incarcerated for about 20 years, um, really dope dude, been out for a while, doing well, uh, and having a conversation with him yesterday and trying to get him to name specifically what was, uh, what are the circumstances, what, who was at fault for his community suffering the way it did that put him in a position to, to find himself incarcerated? Um, and, and he could, he could say it, he could grasp, but he didn't have the language that many of us maybe hold. And that is not to say we hold all the correct language, because I think there is a problem with how we think about language and mastery of that language to then give us power over people who don't have the language. I've talked about that at a different time. I'm sure that's recorded somewhere. Um, what I'm thinking about though, is that part of our deconstructive or transforming uh, understanding as Priya said, um, part of becoming a multidisciplinary person I want to really push y'all to say it, it, it is, is listening to the stories of those most impacted and not trying to correct their thinking or not trying to hold power over them, but trying to help them form language together, form narrative and story together. Uh, there is just not a lot of opportunities within academic spaces to genuinely have those interactions. And we may do a case study, we may read a book, um, we may watch a video and we may get some of that information that's really critical but I think being able to process that together um, with those most impacted, uh, building that relationship um, has to happen, which leads us to our last point here, which is actually becoming, actually thinking about partnerships. Actually, before we get to that, I, I need to say this, systems change is slow. Um, you're right, Sarah, that's on me. Uh, I should know my slides better. I'm moving a little too quick here. Um, if we can go to the next slide, Sarah, we can, we can close this one down. Uh, part of relationship building is that it happens slow. And that is the same for systems thinking too. Systems change has to be slow. And I, I, I would contend um, that part of our attraction to finding broken parts, not looking at systems as a collective piece is that we get some sort of affirmation, comfortability, high, whatever you wanna use for the, for the word, when we fix a broken piece to say, look, we did it. We did something, we solved something. I've been doing racial equity work for the last five years and I am continually astounded by as much progress as we make in language and understanding um, and um, you know, the books that come out and the material that's available. There has been some legitimate shifts in how we talk about race in America versus five years ago. But what really has not shifted, at least in my community where I'm doing this work, is folks' willingness to stay in the conversation for a longer period of time, to stay in a place of discomfort or uncomfortability for a longer period of time, mainly because we are conditioned to think real change does not happen this quickly or just slowly. It has to happen quickly. And if we're not in a position to see change happen, or if we're not gonna solve things like racism or classism or a particular health inequality, we're not gonna get rid of Cancer Alley and solve that, then I'm just not gonna stay committed. And that is a challenge that I think is particularly difficult for, for this generation um, of y'all that are in school, that are students. Um, system change, like I was saying, requires partnership with those closest to marginalization. And partnership implies a long-term entanglement, a long-term engagement. Um, I have a sentence on that that I didn't finish. So we're gonna just go to the last slide because it clearly wasn't that important. This is where I, I, I Jen Bailey is an activist um, in, in Tennessee. And, and I think she just has some tremendous insight on the world. And one of the things that I, she recently was in a podcast that I wanna draw a quote from. And as we're thinking about what it means to deconstruct our thinking around engaging systems, stepping back and looking at the systems, the barriers to our ability to step back. I think one of the things is just our inability to commit to the long-term process. We're conditioned not to commit, we're encouraged not to commit. The cost of commitment is high. 
And I think it is especially a unique challenge for our Gen Z folks. And Jen Bailey, I think, sums this up really beautifully. So I'll read this for us. I have this theory that millennials were called to be cartographers, to be map makers at a time when institutions were crumbling and the world was shifting in a completely different way. And we were creating blueprints or trying to survey the land and understand it. And that the folks who are coming behind me in Gen Z, man, they are builders. They have a no nonsense way of cutting through things and a fierce sense of urgency that I both honor and respect and I worry about for them because I think they are facing so many existential crises at once, and they, quite ha they haven't quite had enough time to experience to know, or experience to know that they don't have to answer those questions all at once. But they're coming in with a sophistication and a nuance that I think is the stuff of building the new infrastructure. And by new infrastructure, she doesn't mean roads and highways and bridges, but she means building the pathways towards a new world. And I love this quote, I think it's super powerful and I'm interested if this feels accurate for our millennials in the room. Um, does, does being a cartographer, a map maker, uh, trying to put a blueprint together for a crumbling world, does that sound reflective to your experiences? I'll speak up because I'm a millennial very solidly. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like most people are, um, uh, most people in the room probably fall more in the Gen Z category. But for myself as a, as a millennial, I, I would say that this uh, resonates with my experience and that, um, you know, of, you know, coming of age around, you know, the turn of the millennium and all of the socio political things that were happening then, as well as, um you know as growing into you know it was you know through you know the my mid-20s of when you know a lot of, like when black lives matter protests really like formed and started in response to mike brown and trayvon martin and so like using that as well as um the like anti-war protests against the against entering Iraq if, and or even earlier than that, like of seeing that as a like using that and those kind of generational shifts the and the like responses to um you know world events and as a like you know the kind of disillusionment that happened with with 9-11 and the responses to that. And so then needing to create a new uh, map for, for the way forward, but not necessarily knowing um, how to build that. It, it, sorry, my cat is being wild. <laughs> uh, but yes, this resonates with me as a, as a millennial. Yeah, I, I feel that, Christine. I feel like that's a really dope way of putting it. And I, as I was sitting with this quote this week, I, I just could not get out of my head the fact that the internet didn't, it, it existed, but in such a different way than it does now. Like, y'all, when I was uh, in middle school, like, we still had dial-up. Uh, like, I had to listen to the dial-up noises assault my ears just to look something up. And the, the capacity of a search engine really wasn't there. Um, there was no Wikipedia existed, but not anything like it does today. And I'm not trying to sound like uh, some sort of old person. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with sounding like, a, oh, shout out to Ask Jeeves. Or if you remember Cha Cha, when you text Cha Cha, um, and that goofy, you, used, you could text questions to a texting service and it would give you answers, which at the time was faster doing your phone than trying to look something up on the internet with your phone. Um, and you still have to pay for text. So there was there was this lack of connection that wasn't available, this lack of uh, answers. And so I, I love this quote because I feel like and I'm, a, I'm at the tail end of the millennials. Right. And and I feel like there was such a, a, a passion for those who are older than me to try to make sense of things. But I look at what my generation has done, which has been good in most ways. I'm not necessarily sure we built things. Like I believe this next generation is going to build. Um, I'm, we may have built frameworks, we may have built blueprints, and as Jen says, maps. Um, but I'm not sure we've built things that are sustained and built to last. And I genuinely think, you know, you all in the room who are Generation Z, um, 
Uh, also, is Zoomers a pejorative word? Like, I only hear it used as pejorative, but someone throw that in the chat whether I'm free to say that or not and it not be an insult. Um, and I see what y'all are capable. I see what you're already doing. And I have such an excitement because there's an awareness and a capacity and an accessibility to observing how systems exist and the ability to step back. And, uh, and you have the ability to commit lives to addressing the systems. But just as Jen says, uh, there is a, a worry that I hold as well in that there are so many things to face at once. Um, Eleanor, I think you said earlier that it, it can be exhausting or overwhelming to try and look at the system as a whole. And there are a lot of systems that y'all are awakening to in a way that my generation didn't awaken to all at once or ever have to awaken to, still have not awakened to. Um, I live, again, I, I said I live in a gentrifying neighborhood and folks are participating in systems while proudly verbalizing uh, their lack of involvement in those systems and the dissonance is astounding, a dissonance that your generation just hasn't stood for. Um, and I appreciate that. But there is a, a legitimate fear that I hold that do you have the capacity to stay in, stay locked in, stay committed, stay leaning in, stay soft at the heart to what is possible in partnership to what is possible in reimagining systems, destroying worlds to build something new. And I think the, the final thing I wanna say is that the GlobeMed model offers opportunities for that. Um, and I think GlobeMed as an institution is looking to create that. But for many of you, you will lean in towards something with a great deal of conviction and passion for your four to five, four to six years in college. And what I'm wondering is, do we have the capacity to step back at the end of that and say, what do I want to continue to commit to? What do I want to continue to hold to systems change? Um, am I going to hang my hat on this one problem that we solved and not address the system at hand that's still continuing to, to drop the hammer on the folks that I partnered with? What does partnership look like when we are legitimately interested in addressing the system that is causing people to be unwell? What does partnership look like when we have a more expansive understanding of health to know that our partners can't be successful no matter how good we are at fundraising, no matter how good we are at um, you know, translating something or getting volunteers if this system-wide problem is not dealt with and addressed? Now, that doesn't mean you have to solve it. And I think that's the important piece here. You are facing so many existential crises at once, and you don't have to have all the answers at once. In fact, you don't have to have the answers at all. Um, and, I, and I think that's also part of the challenge is being able to say, I'm gonna to commit to the work, I'm gonna to commit to the process, I'm gonna to commit to the relationship and partnership, knowing I may not see the end of the work, knowing that I may not be the one to fulfill the end of the work. And I think that is an art and a skill and, and something that requires something deep within us to be mined out and unlocked. And again, I think this generation can do it. You know, I think y'all have what it takes, um, but can we keep our hearts soft? Can we keep our, our minds open and continue to allow ourselves to see the expansiveness of, of the world around us and the systems that are around us? If we can do those things, then I think we can have a reimagining of global health, some sort of catalytic moments, series of moments that draw us towards radically understanding health in a way that we've never before, radically understanding partnership in a way we haven't before. Um, Y'all are builders and you have what it takes to build a new world. And my generation gonna get in y'all's way, the generation in front of me gonna get in y'all's way. Uh, we are really good at that. Uh, but if you have what it takes to continue to sit with the work and understand that time as we understand it and process it linearly, um, doesn't allow us to fully see the end of the work itself, and that's okay. Uh, how can we build something that is there to last? So I'm going to stop because there may be, you know, I can keep going, but there may be some questions, there may be some thoughts, there may be some disruptions. I want to hear what those might be for you, uh, hear what you might be holding in this moment.
And a better question might be, you know, thinking about your, your response, Priya, what, what is keeping your heart soft? What is keeping you open to the possibilities? I have a thought from earlier. Um, when we were talking about how global health is a commodity for universities and schools to use to advertise for their programs and to make money off of students, I, I thought about a lot of the global health, like public health organizations we have on campus and in what way, like what part do they play? Like, are they just like resume builders for kids to go to med school and what is med school even for? And part of this whole system of paying for healthcare that we shouldn't have to pay for. But like, is how do you, how can you, sorry, there's noise on my street. How can you like justify how can you quantify, obviously you can't quantify it, but like, how do you show that you're doing good? And like, I think about this and like, like if I thought about these other organizations, like where's GlobeMed fit into this? And obviously like I'm having these conversations, which means I'm thinking about it, but I guess I was, I was thinking about that after we spoke. Yeah, that's, a, that's such a powerful question. Thank you for that. What is, how do we do good is, is what I'm hearing you ask. And if we can, I mean, I think to your earlier point, I'm not sure, and this isn't just a problem on campuses. This is, a, this is like the nonprofit industrial complex as a whole is not honest about what they intend and what their intentions are for existence. What are you hoping to accomplish? What are you hoping to do? And, and a lot of the organizations that are designed to quote unquote help things or help people aren't clear that that's not actually why they exist. And so I think we can interrogate organizations. Are we just here because we're building resumes or are we just here because we're trying to make a difference? And I think if we're trying to make a difference, if that's our, our, our truest intention, um, those that we are trying to serve and impact have to be the ones to define what good enough is or have to define what good can be. We can co-create that, sure. Uh, but without their insight, without their involvement, um, we're going to continue to tell ourselves a version of truth or tell ourselves part of a mythology that uh, makes us sound like we are the heroes um, or that we are vanquishing the villains of the system. And what we need to have are, are folks who are, um, my kids are coming out of the room, I'm sorry. Uh, what we need to have is a, a, a genuine collaboration with those who are most impacted. And, and I think let them help us define what good is. Um, let them define what that is. Because it probably isn't going to be nothing to do with resume building. It's not going to be anything to do with what that next graduate step is. It's going to be about what is happening in their, their world. What are the systems that are impacting them? Um, I don't know if that answers your question well, but that's what comes to mind for me. Are there others who have thoughts on that? But I do love the, the question itself. We probably have time for one more thought, one more question. Is there anything else that folks are holding? Did I, if I did not answer that question fully, please let me know. We could revisit it together. But um, I th again, I think it's a fantastic question, powerful question. Just thinking about the, the slide about taking it slow. And I'm thinking about um, something that we've been talking about at GlobeMed for a while, which is that like how we go about transforming systems is almost as um, important as the outcomes of the work that we're doing. Um, and thinking about how um, the ways we go about building our partnerships, the ways we go about connecting with each other within this community can be little microcosms of the way that we want the world to function if we take it slow. And it takes a lot of time to build those relationships and to um, you know, really collaborate with everybody at the table or maybe even a brand new table built for the people that, that need to be there. Um, and that is tough when we feel the urgency of all of the different things we want to accomplish. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking about the kind of tensions between 
you know, wanting to build, wanting to see the change happen. And also that last uh, piece you left us, question you left us, which was, which was how can we stay committed knowing we may not see the end of our work and, and see those kind of ways that we adjust our ways of working with one another and our work, ways of working with partners as part of the successes in this process. That's helpful. That's dope too. Thank you, Priya. All right, any other final thoughts, feelings, ideas, concerns? I think something I was thinking about like on that second slide with the with the quote where we were we were talking about like how the definition of health from the World Health Organization isn't like really reflective of like a lot of people's environmental kind of situations and like historical and social kind of situations. Um, I was like, I, at first I like immediately my thought was from the angle of like, like, well, that goes to show like that a lot of people are really far from achieving like a status of like health. So like we have a lot of work to do in terms of public health. And then my thought after that was well, wait, that goes, that just goes to show that a lot of institutions that are supposed to be promoting health don't really know what they're promoting. So I think something that I was trying to resolve throughout a lot of that slide was thinking like balancing the focus between like addressing the like shortcomings in the institutions that are supposed to be kind of addressing a lot of like health problems and helping people and also focusing on like actually making the like making the world a better place by like direct like helping in the communities so both improving institutions and helping communities um like at, at the same time um, which don't have to like contradict at all but it is kind of like a i don't know two different things so i was just thinking about that yeah that's a great thought that's a great thought to that first one I, joy james is a individual that's deeply formative to me she says that uh, those closest to material struggle are the ones best equipped to wage uh, struggle. Um, and oftentimes our systems are trying to prescribe solutions to individuals and people uh, and don't have that, that wisdom and are not equipped to wage struggle. Um, and so to your first point, I think absolutely, you're spot on there. Um, and I'm glad you're seeing that difference that exists because uh, we mix those up relatively easily in most circumstances. It's fantastic. All right, any final, final, final things? I will note, um, Priya, you, this came to mind when you shared this notion of the slide about going slow. That's a slide I spent the least amount of time on. Um, so you talk about slowing down. I sped up at that slide. Uh, evidence of where I need to continue to be conscious of, of how I understand this work. Um, still so much to learn. All right, y'all. Well, if that is it, I think it is safe to land this plane. Um, I appreciate you all going on the journey with me um, and having this dialogue tonight. Thank you all for the input and feedback you offered. I hope this is helpful, insightful in any sort of way. Um, if nothing else, uh, Thank you to the voices of Jen Bailey, Deshaun Harrison um, for helping me uh, have a much more expansive expression of the world and, and reimagine um, the world as it ought to be versus what it is. Uh, but if, if nothing else, um, we all be safe. Continue to um, commit to the long struggle, um, the long uh, bending of the moral arc um, away from chaos and towards something that is more whole. Uh, continue to step back and look at systems uh, for all that they are um, and continue to recognize where you exist in our chronological time of time and order. That is this generation, you are builders, um, but also tasked to build up a lot more um, than maybe the world is ready for. And maybe that we are as individuals ready for us. So we have to keep ourselves open and our hearts soft. Um, so thank you for having me. It's always good to connect with y'all. Um, be safe this fall. It's going to be an interesting fall. Um, and peace out.
Thank you, Josh. And before everyone hops off the call, um, I'm going to put a feedback survey link in the chat. This was a really great session and we would love to know what students got or are taking away from the session. And so it might look different from other surveys we've shared with you in the past, but it would mean so much to us. And we are going to share the feedback with Josh as well about what special things, what important things you're taking from this session as we reimagine health and throughout the rest of the week, reimagine partnership and movements and leadership later on. So thank you so much, Josh, and thank you everyone for showing up today.